Yeah, <laughs> totally. Thanks for that. Uh, welcome. Yes, Scratch has heard the speech a few times and it has changed quite a lot over the last uh, month. Um, I guess transparency is a really interesting word when you, when you apply it to a, a journey, whether it's a vocational journey, how you treat your family and your friends, the kind of ways that you actually interact with people and the kind of life that you lead. And it's been a really interesting project actually applying that term to where I've come from. And obviously working for Antipodes, most people in this room who do know me know me as the water girl and Antipodes has definitely been a really integral part of that journey and it's been um, a massive stage for building my personal profile and I will be forever in gratitude for that business. But one of the things that struck me about transparency, um, you kind of don't really get a better example of transparency than, than this product. And the design principle behind that bottle was actually that they wanted that bottle to disappear on a restaurant table. So they wanted the heroes of the, of the restaurant experience to actually be what was seen. So beautiful wine, fantastic food, and the friends that you're dining with. So um, it, they actually wanted to make it so transparent that you saw straight through it and looked at everything else. And I think they've pretty much achieved that. But in a really classic sort of way of, um, I guess, ironic transparency, it's also become one, probably one of the most photographed bottles of water in the world. So it's almost become so seen that it's no longer transparent. <laughs> and I kind of wanted to show that as my sort of, or open the presentation with that because it's sort of the mood that I found I started to see transparency had played in my journey. And it's sometimes been positive and it's sometimes actually been really negative. So um, when I sort of thought about when transparency has actually been applied to um, my creative journey and when my creative journey started, the first time I actually cognitively thought about that was when I was in high school. And um, my first year of high school was 1985. I know I look a, a lot younger, but you know, I am actually 43. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, uh, so 1985, it was a really interesting time in the world. The world was on the cusp of change. We were sort of starting to reach that time when you didn't have to have a job for your entire life. But there was still a real hangover of that. There was still a hell of a lot of pressure to choose a career and stick with it. And if you didn't, if you left a job after three or four years, then you were considered to be flippant and unreliable and actually a bit of a risk to hire. So when I was a 13-year-old entering high school, there was a hell of a lot of pressure on seeing into the future, that whole you know, what were you going to be, and sticking to it. And personally, I found that really overwhelming. And I, there were two reasons for that. First, I didn't actually know what I wanted to do, and I also rejected the idea of having to know what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. As um, Jade has mentioned, you know, my folks, um, mum was 58 when she gave up a physiotherapy practice. My dad was a school teacher, and they put their entire savings in the ground in a vineyard in central Otago. And it was an incredible move on their part. You know, they had a family to support. They had careers they'd spent their whole lives feeling pressured to stick with. And I guess that's sort of where I started to get that thinking of it doesn't have to be forever. So uh, the advice that I was given when I was at high school, because I didn't have, because I couldn't be transparent with, transparent with the people that were giving me advice, I couldn't tell them what I wanted to be, the advice was that the best thing to do was to choose a broad range of subjects and art wasn't one of them. So I could do English, I could do maths, and I could do physics, and I could do chemistry, and I could do biology. And I had dyslexia when it came to maths. In fact, it was like Greek. I, I, it freaked me out, I had a real fear of it. And because I felt the pressure to conform and to obey, if you like, um, I completed my high school years at the end of 1990 as a seventh former with a really impressive range of straight Cs. <laughs> and absolutely no self-esteem. So I started my university, I managed to get enough to get my university entrance, only just. But I followed the herd into university and really not knowing again what I was doing. And I was really worried about what my future was to hold. I felt like I'd let myself down. And that was sort of a pretty shitty way to start, um, you know, life after education. So I lasted a term at university. Um, I was the first, I've got two, I, well I had a brother and I've got a sister and they're older than me and I was the first family member that uh, had to pay for my university. And I worked out that if I left before the end of term I got my fees back, so that was a bonus. <laughs> 
And I decided the best way to let mum and dad know that I dropped out was to get myself a job before I had that conversation. So I got myself a job working as a um, ski lifty at Treble Cone Ski Field in Wanaka, which was a bloody good move. And I spent the next um, you know, few months having a ball. I met people from all over the world. I stopped feeling pressure about what I needed to be. I was outdoors, I was active, I was finally getting to burn around a hill. Um, the only thing with working in the ski industry, if it doesn't snow, you don't get paid. Um, and that is a bit of an issue. So in order to um, pay rent, I um, started to do some illustration work um, and get paid for it, which was something that um, that didn't transpire, it didn't actually come out quite as clearly as I hoped it did, but anyway. Um, I started to do illustration work, so I was doing um, ski, board, uh, ski posters and snowboarding posters and pub flyers and invitations to parties. And my sister at the time was going through medical school and um, needed a lot of um, her uh, assignments illustrated, so I actually started to get quite a lucrative job for a lot of medical students doing their um, <laughs> illustrations for their, for their exams, which was actually really good fun. I can't tell you the Latin names, but I've got a pretty good understanding of how you know, anatomy works these days. It's, <laughs> this is a good learning curve. Um, and it wasn't until a family friend actually uh, took a look at my drawings, and a, f a friend of mum and dad's, and he was a jeweller. And he looked at my, my drawings and said, you know, to me, your drawings are sort of so technical and so graphic in, the, in their style that you either need to be a sign writer or you should be a jeweller. That, that actually transcend really well into metalwork. And that was a real light bulb moment for me. I basically, um, it had never sort of come to my attention that there, were, there was a job like that. So, um, it took me about two years to work out how to get to be a jeweller. I'd found a course in Australia that I really wanted to do, um, Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, um, really big silversmithing type projects, like really big goblets and, and um, plates and uh, teapots and things like that. But the problem was they only took 12 people a year, and that's in, in, in its entirety. So globally, they only took 12 people. So I spent two years trying to get into the Melbourne course um, and while I was waiting to do that I, was, I went back to university and did my design papers and uh, art history and things like that. Um, and then and as, as, as things happen in life, um, a jewellery apprenticeship became available in Dunedin. So I was sitting right in the right place at the right time. And so I spent four years or an apprenticeship talk, 8,000 hours, sitting next to one guy a metre away from him. Um, and actually a majority of my time was spent um, resizing and repairing Michael Hill jewellery. So that was a really interesting learning curve. <laughs> it's actually really good value if, you pay, if, if you're buying sort of at the lower end of the spectrum, but I wouldn't recommend spending a lot of money on really expensive pieces. <laughs> Just quietly. <laughs> Maybe in this room. <laughs> Uh, but so I, I'd really found myself, that was, a, I, I actually for the first time in my life, you know, actually I'm really good at something, I can actually do this and I'm making really great jewellery and I translate things that I am doodling on a page into pieces that people are wearing for their life and that felt really rewarding. So I immediately got on a plane, did the Kiwi thing and headed over to the States. I had a job as a jeweller in um, New York, it started in a summer camp and one of the parents who owned a jewellery business in New York at the summer camp um, hired me totally illegally in New York. Um, so I had a blast and I was living with a friend who represented New Zealand and the UN at the time, so I was living it up large in a government paid apartment um, pretty much on Central Park. So it was pretty cool time to be in the Big Apple. Um, and unfortunately, as much as I wanted to stay in New York, I couldn't. The green cards weren't forthcoming and neither was sponsorship. And I decided I probably wanted to get back to the States at some time in my life. So I decided I better not get booted out illegally. So I um, moved to London, which was a really interesting experience because I couldn't get a job as a jeweller there, no matter how hard I tried. And yet actually London, England, had been the mecca of jewellery making. From that traditional point of a trade apprenticeship, London was seen as mecca. But there were two factors that were against me. Depressingly, the first was I was a woman, and I got told that by pretty much every jeweller I went to. It was very patriarchal, and jewellers were men. And the second thing, even though my trade apprenticeship was an internationally recognised qualification, I was a Kiwi, and we had this number eight approach to everything, number eight wire approach to everything, which meant that uh, they didn't know where to put me. I could set a stone, I could design the piece, I could, make, I could melt the metal, I could you know, c construct the whole ring, and they just don't know, that's not how they ro rolled over there. 
So I spent a lot of time over there doing um, really sort of unusual jobs. I did a bit of web design, I did a bit of um, uh, uh, waitressing, I did a bit of reception work, I ended up working as a press and media operator for, um, or officer for uh, charity, baby charity, which was really great. That was actually amazing, I ended up having um, cucumber sandwiches with um, Cherie Blair at 10 Downing Street and met a couple of royals at Kensington Palace and did all sort of fluffy stuff that you know you sort of got to do when you're in England don't you <laughs> and um, but then 9-11 happened and it, that was actually a, a bit of a reality check uh, the friend that I had been working with at the UN had thankfully survived the building the UN was right next to the trade towers um, but it it basically you know, made New Zealand look pretty, like a pretty good place to, to go home to. So I returned home and I um, went back to stay with mum and dad down in central Otago for a wee while and worked in the vineyards to sort of get a bit of money to um, sort of again think about what the heck I'm going to do with myself. Again I'd sort of lost that clarity of what the journey was, where was I. I'd, I'd been really knocked by the fact that I couldn't get jewellery work in London and actually I'd started to doubt my skills because I'd felt like I was so rusty. Um, so um, there was quite a sort of a definite um, uh, event that changed things again for me and I had a very bad car accident with my folks. We were one of those fantastic statistics um, in central Otago of being hit by a tourist on the wrong side of the road. Um, it was a utter head-on collision around a corner and um, Dad broke his neck, Mum broke every rib in her body and, and uh, I pretty much a bit the same. So that changed that year quite a lot <laughs> and we spent a lot of time in recovery. Um, and that was a really good time to actually think about what maybe I wanted to do. So I decided that it was back to jewellery, I was going to go to Auckland and, and get back into that world. And one of the things that uh, happened when I came to Auckland to, get my, my, to carry the, on with the jewellery journey was I uh, started working on a jewellers in High Street that was very high end. Um, one thing about Auckland is there are some people in this town with some cash. And if you're trained to make jewellery from platinum and from diamonds and sapphires, then you need people with cash. So it was sort of the first time that I'd had real experience with actually making bespoke pieces with really great budgets and choosing really great stones. So I started to get into gemology as an alternative to another career and or something that supported my jewellery. So I started doing my diamond grading papers. And it was really fascinating. I found, I mean diamonds are amazing. They are, <coughs> they're unparalleled. There is nothing like a diamond. They are absolutely rock stars. They are um, literally. <laughs> <laughs> And um, <laughs> it's a shocker, uh, but they really are. I mean, you can't, you can't. Once you start learning about diamonds, you actually can't sort of, you know, underestimate how much you get sort of blown away by looking at these things. I mean, there was one stone I remember looking at that had a flaw, and the flaw in the stone it was an otherwise perfect diamond, and the flaw in this diamond was a, um, what we call a fault sediment, which turned out to be a wee ruby, and that ruby was in the shape of a heart. It was kind of nuts, so that was pretty cool to look at that. I mean, the pr it's priceless, and to get it, to be able to hold that in your hands and have a look at it was off the charts. Um, but the more and more I started sort of doing this work, and the more and more I started um, making beautiful engagement rings for young couples in love, the more and more I started to learn about the industry itself. And while we were looking at these beautiful stones and judging them on their transparency and their clarity, it turns out that there's a hell of a lot of lack of transparency and non-transparency in this industry. Um, to get two grams of A-grade diamonds, which are jewellery worthy diamonds, so that's kind of like my thumbnail worth of stone, you have to move 200 tonnes of earth. And I'm just going to show you a... Um, now, how do I... Is that right? Oh yes, wait. Just going to have to show you a film.
so you can kind of see where I was uh, going with this, um, I guess the idea of, is that going to work like that? Oh yeah, sweet. Um, yeah, so you can see that in actual fact, you know, you can see why I started to feel pretty uncomfortable with being involved in that industry. I mean, uh, in 2011 there were still reports of, um, you know, the Sierra Leone region, I think it was 26% uh, of the mining force are children. In the Angolan province, 46% of the mining force are children. The reason I had that graphic of the hand that's cut off, that's sort of um, become a major global campaign for um, the rebel militia that control a lot of these mines in order to prevent the miners from stealing, they'd cut off their hand, one of their hands on the first day. That's, that's how they start work, minus a hand. And if they look like they've stolen, they just cut off the other hand. So it's, without bringing you guys all down, um, as that video actually showed, there are, there are, you know, it doesn't mean that you don't support the industry. The transparency is that you choose the people that are being responsible within the industry. It's important to support it in the right way so that people do have jobs, but make sure that you are paying attention to actually where the materials are coming from and what kind of materials you're using. Um, so as we've alluded to, I'm, I'm fortunate that I um, have farming folks and the farming that they do is uh, they grow wine. And um, it's fortunate for a lot of reasons, but um, the main one is that um, through osmosis, really, I became fascinated with wine and had uh, developed a really good understanding of it, mainly because every time I went home for a holiday, mum would throw the secateurs at me and say, get out there and prune some vines, um, which actually I used to hate, quite frankly. Um, <laughs> but um, again, it's another world where transparency and clarity is how we judge quality. and. Uh, there were two ways in the wine industry that, um, or in the work that I was doing, where transparency sort of started to really impact the way that I felt about the job. So in the first instance, not all wine is clear and not all great wine is clear. I mean, even on the basis, and this is an interesting little tidbit for everybody this morning, even a Cabernet Sauvignon is a thicker skin fruit versus say a Pinot Noir. So if you're looking at a, a glass of red wine and you're not quite sure what it is, if it's slightly cloudy, it's probably not a Pinot Noir. And that's based on the fact that it's just a thinner skin grape. That's the first sort of thing that a sommelier might look at if they're being asked to, to identify a wine. But on the other side of that too, there is a movement which I'm sure a lot of people in the room know, a lot of my hospitality mates are all sort of keen to, to investigate at the moment, and that's natural wine making, where they don't do a lot of refining and they don't strip the wine back to make it look beautiful and perfect. It actually just looks like how it's been made. And um, sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, but that's a really important thing. I found myself starting to want to sort of remove some of that absolute level of perfection that we were sort of driving into the community that we were trying to sell the wine to. The other side of it that I started to really have a problem with was the transparency of the business practice. When, I mean, I don't know about anyone else in this room, but for, for the most part, when I think of the word transparency, it's around business acumen. It's about, it's open communication, they treat each customer fairly and the same, and that, you know, they operate within the same sort of guidelines for everybody that's involved in the business. And in theory, I agree with that. And in practice, that's exactly what we were doing with the way we were selling the wine. But I started to have a real problem with that because I had, say, a customer over here who's a you know, young husband and wife team who have a fantastic restaurant that's small and that's their sole business and that every penny they earn goes into it and every hour they have free goes into it versus a, a, a collection of investors who own 20 restaurants. Neither one of those is any better or worse than the other. But I can't treat those people the same. The rules aren't the same for those two customers. And what bothered me were, you know, I was getting things like um, volume offers. These guys had 20 restaurants. If I got a glass ball listing in every restaurant they had, they could do volume so I could give them a really good price. But I couldn't give the little guy a good price. And that started to sit really badly with me. And what it meant that I started to do was break the rules. And what that meant was that I was starting to not be transparent with the people that were paying my salary, and that was pretty uncool. And at that time I'd been um, being mentored a little bit by Simon Woolley, who's one of the co-founders of Antipodes Water, and he is a guru. This guy has the ability to think strategically like that, and he has this ability to see things in as many different positive ways as he possibly can. And one of the things that I like to say about Simon, he's the guy that finds the can and can't. 
you know, and that's where some of these protocols and rules that were supposedly were put in place to provide transparency to the business, he would actually agree, you know, we would have conversations around this is just ridiculous, it's actually doing the opposite. These customers are telling us they need it to be done this way and we're telling them it can't be done that way in the name of fairness, well that is bollocks and it's not how I wanted to do business. So Simon actually tapped me on the shoulder and that's when I started working for Antiquities Water Company. And I actually said no to him a lot, uh, quite a lot before I actually said yes. And the reason I said yes was because I wanted to work not so much to sell this beautiful bottle of amazing water, but because I wanted to learn from him. I wanted to be able to work with Simon. I wanted that um, mentoring. And so started the job and six months later he re retired. <laughs> <laughs> And you can imagine the email that I sent him. <laughs> what the? F I, you know, like, come on, mate. <laughs> you know, we had an agreement here. But anyway, the, 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 I guess really the experience or the opportunity that, that presented was I ended up with complete freedom. And um, I started to, as uh, I alluded to earlier in the talk, that I ended up getting a hell of a lot of um, profile. I started to be able to. It's amazing when you have a product that doesn't have alcohol in it how far the community reaches. You know, you can start talking to a lot of different communities. You know, you can start talking to surfers and to yoga people and you can start talking to high school kids. And you, I mean, I've actually presented Antipodes business model to um, the school girls at Dio and actually, you know, that's a really cool thing to be able to do. Um, and I started to really personally enjoy that different level of communication and the fact that it's sort of, you know, you could be talking to a 65 year old who has a fantastic wine cellar and just wants a really great water that goes well with his Pinot and his whiskey, to a 14 year old who wants to learn more about brand design. Pretty cool range of, of work. Um, and I guess um, that's when I sort of started feeling like perhaps I needed to, with Simon now removed from the business, he lives, spends half his time in Mexico and half his time here, which is definitely what I aspire to end up doing, by the way. <laughs> um, that is the transparency. I've learnt how to see into the future. <laughs> the future is Mexico. <laughs> um, and, but basically, I sort of started to get to the point where I felt like I needed to do my own thing. And I'd been approached um, quite regularly by small wineries who had been watching what I was doing with Antipodes. And Claire and Mike from Hui Vineyards were one of them, and they'd offered me a job as a sales and marketing manager. And I sat down with a very good friend of mine, Jimmy Barber, who has his own wine distribution company, and said to him, you know, what do you think? Do you think it's a good idea to go and do this? And Jimmy said a line that has been life-changing. He said, it's a shame you can't do both. Can't sell activities and Hui are together. And I sort of spent the next 24 hours going, can't do both, can't do both, can't do both. Why can't I do both? Surely I can do both. I think I can do both. How the hell do I do both? What do, I, you know, what do I have to do to do both? And why do I want to do both? And I think one of the things that I started to see while I was at Antipodes, I'd changed sides of the fence. I'd, I'd gone from working for the distributor to the distributor working for me. And I started to see this really big disconnect between the boutique, trade, uh, the boutique producer, who was a, effectively a, a really good farmer, and the distribution company. The farmer would sign the contract with the distributor and think that everything past the farm gate was done, and that's not the case. A distributor is a really great box mover. They've got a sales team on the ground and it's their job to get the box from the warehouse to the customer who wants to buy it. But someone needs to tell that story. And so, basically, I um, started to think about what that business might look like that, so that I could go to Hui and Antipodes with that idea. And what it turned out that I was actually sort of looking at doing was what, taking really good craft people who were artisan producers and introducing them to the trade. And there was a word that um, meant a lot to me. I'd heard it um, and it, for some reason uh, it really res resonated with me. And I liked how it looked in font. I did lots of, my doodle books came out and I did lots of drawings and I liked how it was very formulated and very linear but very strong. I liked the fact that it was easy to pronounce, I liked the fact that phonetically it sounded really strong but also maybe a bit softer. Um, I liked the fact that it alluded to the two particular markets that I was trying, or channels of, of trade that I was trying to communicate with. The real problem was where I'd heard it was um, in films like Zero Dark Thirty and programs like Homeland. So this word was actually coined by the CIA in 1960 and what it means is, its true definition is, it means methods of espionage. <laughs> 
so it's actually, um, so like in Zero Dark Thirty, an example is when, um, you know, sort of a terrorist cell would buy a prepay phone, talk to their guy, put it in a rubbish bin, go around the corner, buy another prepaid phone, chuck it, chuck it in a rubbish bin. That's tradecraft. So there was a bit of a risk with using this word. <laughs> And I sort of mulled on it for a couple of weeks, but I just kept thinking, you know what, actually, the one thing that started to really get to me about the way these small boutique wineries and farmers were being represented was often the marketers and the PR companies that were representing them were showing themselves first. It was all about going to something where there were celebrities at a party. Well, bugger that, actually. You know, it's not about celebrities at a party. It's about everybody that wants to buy this. It's about the guy that walks into the supermarket, or it's about the woman that's, you know, catching up with her friends on the weekend. It's not about celebrities at a party. It's actually about making sure that brand is first, that the first thing that people see. So I decided that it was probably worth the risk. And in the name of transparency, it was actually really important that my clients understood that by taking me on to look after their account, I was going to be the last people that the pu person, that the, last, that the public actually see. That it's all about huia and tippities. And that they, if I'm actually doing my job right, then their business should grow, their sales should increase, their brand should get better exposure, and no one should know I've been involved. And in sort of full circle, I guess one of the things that was really cool is when Jimmy Barber um, had given me that eureka moment and that line that will change the rest of my life, um, he also needed a hand with one of his brands. So um, Champagne Collet, which um, is a very nice drop, um, has also become part of the portfolio. We've got a couple of key ambassadors in the front row. <laughs> Actually, just most of the front row is uh, keen Collet drinkers. And you know, this is a champagne that was established in the 1920s and it's brand new to New Zealand. I mean, what an opportunity. It's got all of that old fashioned tradition of that particular market and that particular production, that wine, wine making style. But the guys in France are letting us go for it, you know, go for gold. And um, that's really exciting. So um, that was really rewarding. And I guess sort of in summary, because I better, I'm not sure what the time is. Um, so that's my logo, a nice little bit of um, CIA code for everybody, if they haven't worked it out already. Um, but I guess in summary, for me, transparency, when I look back at that journey, it's been all about challenging rules maybe sometimes breaking them, but that's not really what I'm advocating. It's actually just questioning, you know, are these rules, do these rules have application to the people we're trying to communicate with? And do they make my life enjoyable? Am I, am I getting a buzz out of what I do? I think transparency is intuition. I think it's following your gut. And I think understanding that actually it's your tummy that will tell you more than a lot of other people that are trying to point you in the right direction. As, me, as well meaning as they might be, I think it's inside here and here that you actually, and here that you actually get your best transparency. And I think one of the final things for me is, you know, when I sort of think about, um, when I set up the company, I thought, you know, if this doesn't actually work, what's the worst thing that can happen? And the worst thing that could happen is I go and work for Bex and Dash at Kazador or, you know, and, and, and quite frankly, that would be a hell of a good year to, to, to spend doing that. And so if that, if that was the worst that could happen, well, then let's give it a go. So I think it's also too, transparency is about looking at the moment, but speaking against my 13 year old self, looking into the future and knowing that, you know, failure doesn't just happen because you're running full steam ahead and suddenly the cliff is there. Most ch times, chances are there's been a lot of signs on that journey along the way. And I think you've got to have transparency, transparency of vision to see those signs so that you don't fall off the cliff should you reach it. <laughs> So thanks so much for your time, you guys. It's been a real pleasure. And um, 